Welcome to the Lobster Talks podcast by Lobster Capital, where we celebrate the bold thinkers and innovators driving change in the startup world. I'm your host, Gabriel Jarrison, and today I'm super excited to have Adrian Paolo, co-founder and CEO of Point One, joining me. Adrian, thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Awesome. You have, again, I believe a great founder story for us. And I want to get everyone watching this episode hooked and want everyone to, from the very first seconds, be like, wow, this is cool. I know your story. So in a couple words, please tell us about you and your business and the link between the two. And then, of course, we'll explore and dive deeper into everything. Yeah, sounds good. I probably have a little bit of a non-traditional uh, founder backstory. I thought I was going to be a corporate lawyer. So started off going to law school, kind of following down the path that a lot of kids who are lost and wandering coming out of undergrad do, which is like, great, law school is a good career path, had uh, lawyers in my family, and so kind of went down that road. Kind of realized halfway through that process that startups were pretty cool and, and a little bit more interesting than uh, everything else going on in the world. And so I uh, started to head in that direction and eventually kind of decided I would be a startup lawyer because I was already a little bit committed on the legal road, but the startup thing was exciting. I'm like, okay, great. I'll go be a lawyer for startups. Um, so I went and did that. I worked at a big firm here in SF venture capital practice and a little bit of M&A, but working with startup founders every day. Pretty quickly realized that that wasn't kind of the right direction for me. I think for folks who have kind of a founder mindset, law firms can be a fairly stagnant place. You know, there's not a lot of ability to progress quickly, innovate the kinds of things that you expect to be able to do in a startup. Really, as it turns out, being a startup lawyer is more like being a lawyer than it is like being in a startup which I probably should have realized earlier on. So after I, after about a year, I left that, went to go work for a startup. I was the first lawyer at a Series A fintech platform and then spent a couple of years in sort of uh, non-legal roles there, so product and operations roles. But basically was working on a new product line at that time. It's about a year ago, I guess, around when GPT-4 was coming out. And I think me and a lot of lawyers had that like holy crap moment when... G GPT-4 and then Claude 2 came out. I remember Claude 2 was the first one that let you do the uh, PDF upload. And I was working with these like 100 page contracts at the time for like a venture fund product that we were working on. And I just started sticking these things into Claude and just asking questions. And I was blown away at how good it was at understanding what was going on. Like better than the lawyers I was paying $1,000 an hour to explain the contracts to me. So. For me, that was kind of the moment where I was like, oh my gosh, this is really exciting. This industry is not going to be the same five years from now as it is now. And like, I need to get involved in this in some way. So that was sort of what really compelled me to do something. And I think there's been a lot of narratives that, you know, lawyers are going to be replaced by AI. This has been kind of, is one of those industries that's very sort of frequently identified as sort of a core focus for LLMs. Um, it took me a little while to actually figure out what the right entry point is, though, because you have a lot of people chasing after legal tech with AI. Um, but most of them, I think, are going after the sort of core of what lawyers are doing. So the narrative here is like AI is going to replace lawyers. And so everyone thinks, OK, great, let's just build all the things that lawyers do, uh, but using AI. Having actually been a lawyer and knowing a lot of lawyers, I don't think that approach is going to work very well in the short term, at least. Maybe, you know, maybe 10 years from now, that will be effective. But right now, I think you need to build things that lawyers want to use rather than things that attempt to replace lawyers. And so our approach was basically just let's interview a lot of lawyers and just figure out what lawyers really hate and what they would want right now if we could automate, you know, something for them. And then just try to do that. So just try to build something that they actually want. I guess that's like kind of the YC motto, but a lot of people in legal tech are not actually following that, I think. So anyways, around that time, I met up with my co-founders and basically we just sat down and interviewed like a hundred lawyers and just asked them, what do you hate the most about your job? If we could automate away one thing for you, what would you want? And, you know, not surprisingly to me, because I had experienced this before, a lot of lawyers said timekeeping and billing. So for folks that aren't familiar with how this works, basically lawyers have to record all of their time in six minute increments that they can get billed out to the client. 
if you've ever purchased legal services, you've probably seen bills broken down by the 0.1 of an hour. And the process of actually doing that, of tracking your entire day, your entire life in six minute increments is really, really painful. And causes all kinds of knock on problems like not having accurate bills and not being able to really describe the work that you're doing effectively. So that's pretty much where the idea came from. We actually saw uh, another product called Rewind, which is kind of a consumer version of this that lets you kind of like search back your prior memories, the things you've done on your computer. We saw that and we were like, huh, I wonder if we could do something similar in the legal context, but automate the timekeeping for lawyers. And so, yeah, that's kind of the, the road that we started down. And, you know, the concept is kind of uh, morphed and evolved from there. But that, that's a little bit about the, the founding story. Adrian, I mean, that's such a masterclass in entrepreneurship. Thank you for that. I'll recap. I took some notes for everyone listening. Major, major entrepreneurship masterclass. One, stop paying lawyers. Claude is actually better. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'll put this aside. Uh, You've met, I'm sure, I've met, and everyone knows, hundreds of entrepreneurs who tell you, I don't have the idea. I want to create a business. I don't know what I want to work on. And you didn't start with an idea. You started with a team of co-founders with a sector that you knew. It was your domain, the law, but it could be anything. You could want to work into the golf industry or you know, the AI or whatever, the startups, the B2B machinery, anything. And then you went out and interviewed a hundred lawyers, asking them their pain and their need. That's, you know, it's so simple, but it blows my mind because it's, no one does that. No one does that. And it, I mean, so I've had uh, Anna Berger on the show who kind of said something similar. She said, you know, I went out and just talked to my customers all the time. Again, this is kind of the YC way, like you said, but so few people do that. They're just waiting for, God, whatever, to shine the idea upon them. They're waiting for that spark of genius. And so am I correct to say that you didn't have a single idea except for the sector, and only after interviewing those 100 lawyers, you actually knew what you wanted to work on? That's what you said, right? Correct? I mean, actually, I had way too many ideas, and that was the main problem. So I had spent quite a lot of time looking at this industry, trying to carve it up in different ways, kind of... One of my core hypotheses going into this was that we needed to work around the billable hour model and all of the incentives that that creates. People are familiar with how lawyers bill by the hour. A lot of people don't realize all of the incentives that that creates in the industry, right? It does create an incentive for inefficiency because if you do something faster, you make less money. And so that's kind of like the macro incentive within the legal industry. But then that doesn't apply everywhere and it doesn't apply to all people within a certain sector. And so basically what I was doing was trying to carve up this industry into different sectors and try to get some ideas around, okay, how can I either work within this paradigm or how can I work around it such that those incentives don't apply to me? And so I had, you know, maybe five or six different ideas that I was kind of pursuing. I actually thought some areas in like vertical slices of the legal industry were really interesting, like personal injury law is kind of interesting because it's a very large industry that bills on a contingency basis. So they take a percentage of the recovery. Um, ultimately decided not to pursue that because I was not a personal injury lawyer, didn't really know any personal injury lawyers. So I felt like I had a limited founder market fit in that area. But uh, working on the sort of administrative aspects of the legal practice is one way of, you know, circumventing the disincentives of the billable hour model. And so that was kind of something we had in the back of our mind. And then we basically went into these conversations and tried to do them as neutrally as possible without sort of prompting the lawyers in a particular direction. There's a book I really like called The Mom Test, which uh, talks about how to do early user interviews. And the basic premise of the book is that your users will lie to you and tell you they want things that they don't actually want or that they're not willing to pay for. Um, I think it's a fantastic book. It's very short, it's like 150 pages, um, but it helps to guide you through these early customer interviews without sort of directing people to an answer that you want to hear, which is very, very easy to do. And I have to give a lot of credit to my co-founders as well. You know, they're both technical. We could have started writing code from day one, but uh, we were all pretty committed to spending, you know, months of just doing user research and understanding what the, the right 
path was uh, before we actually dove in on it. That's super cool. Thanks for the book recommendation. Usually I ask at the end of the show, but this is good. The mom test, I'll take a look. Always fascinated by those, those ideas. It's so fascinating to me that on paper, you could start a business without any idea, just by talking to your users. But anyway, uh, and, and again, very, very few people do that. I want to go back because I could probably spend the hour on this. Again, I'm blown away, but I think everyone gets it. You talk to your users and you found their actual pain and you just built a business on, on that. And, and then we're gonna, I'm going to go back to this and how you made it to YC and where you are now. But you said something before that I think is super interesting as well to double click and dig into. You said AI is going to change legal tech or the legal sector forever. I think probably everyone agrees with that, but I'd love to hear your perspective being first a lawyer and now an AI startup in the tech world, in the legal world. How do you think is actually AI going to, to have that impact? Where do you see the world in a year from now, in five to 10 years from now? How do you see happening? What do you see not happening as well? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. I don't think there's an easy answer here. This is kind of an open area of debate across the industry. <clears throat> But I have some broad thoughts on how this is most likely going to progress. So there's a couple of like core tenets here. First of all, LLMs are a perfect fit for the legal industry. The legal industry is all in English. It's, it's natural language and it's structured natural language, right? So it's, it's sort of the, the most perfect fit for the technology. That being said, there are a couple of sort of structural issues with actually automating legal work. First of all, the quality bar is really, really high. I think of this a little bit like driverless cars. 10 years ago, driverless cars were basically good enough to drive on the roads, or at least that was the, the perception, right? Maybe it was at 80, 85%. It took 10 years to get from that to the 99.99 that we're at now. And I think the same thing is going to be true in legal. Just the tolerance for error is just so low. And frankly, that's what you pay lawyers for to make sure that you're not making mistakes. And so that's one issue. And then another issue is just the overall sort of Uh, reluctance of the industry to adopt new technology. Lawyers, like other professional services, have typically been laggards on new technology adoption. They're very risk averse and for good reasons, right? Like they are paid to be risk averse. Those are some of the core issues, but, you know, there's only so much that you can resist the tide of, of technological change. And I think AI will eventually be an irresistible tide of technological change. And so then it's really just a question of how long does it take And what's the sort of shape or character of that evolution? I personally think it's going to take a little bit longer than people think for like lawyers to be entirely replaced. You know, there's, I think there's a lot of sentiment that it might be just a couple of years. I think it's like 10 to 20 years. I mean, AGI may be sure all bets are off, but um, short of that, I think what's going to actually happen is that lawyers are going to be augmented by uh, technology. And the, the task of a lawyer is going to shift a lot. So maybe this is analogous to a software engineer, right? We see all these sort of AI software engineering uh, bots and co-pilots that are out there writing code. I don't think that means that software engineers will cease to exist. I just think that it means they'll be highly leveraged. Like maybe they'll be able to do 10x more. But you still ultimately need somebody there saying, you know, code this, code that, or do it in this way. Um, you need a, a, an architect or sort of a guy doing the orchestration. And I think the same is true in legal. Probably the job of a lawyer is going to shift a lot. Um, a lot of folks don't realize how much of a lawyer's job now is actually kind of low-level stuff, paperwork, right? Searching through contracts to identify things, uh, making the same changes that they've made in a hundred other places. Not a lot of it is like novel and innovative thinking. There is some of that. But if you look at the total hours in a day, there's a lot of rote and repetitive stuff. And so I think over time that stuff is going to start to get automated. And probably what you're going to get is more highly skilled senior lawyers that are doing more of the high level thinking and then kind of directing AI to do It's more of the low levels, which is likely a good thing overall for the actual lawyers themselves. I mean, nobody really likes doing that stuff. 
The flip side is that you probably will need less total lawyers to do that. Although there's an alternative argument there that maybe you'll just end up with more legal services, right? Like you hear the same uh, argument for software engineers, right? Will we need less software engineers or will we just produce a lot more software? It's kind of an open question. And I think in the legal world, there is a, like a lot of excess demand for legal services because lawyers are so expensive. I think a lot of people want legal services, but they're not willing to pay for it. Definitely see this in the startup industry. You know, most of the startups coming out of YC are not hiring lawyers now because they don't want to pay for them. But if those lawyers were, you know, a quarter of the price, that probably would be different. And then you see this even more acutely in SMBs and individuals. And so that's actually an area I find really interesting is like, you know, AI legal zoom or AI for small businesses legal for small businesses, that kind of stuff. Because one, the quality bar is a little bit lower there. There's a little bit more tolerance for error. And two, people are kind of self-serving. They're not really paying for lawyers to a large extent. Think of things like, you know, trust and estate lawyers, criminal lawyers, you know, people who kind of handle the ordinary needs of individual people. And so I'm kind of optimistic that this will actually enable a lot more legal services that are basically not being provided at the moment. But yeah, I guess to come back also to something that we discussed earlier, the billable hour model is, is something that's going to have to change if if this really uh, is to take off. And that's we're kind of stuck in this like weird middle ground right now where most legal services, uh, at least from large firms, are on an hourly basis. I think it's around 85 percent of legal services is on an hourly basis. And so that does create incentives for inefficiency. But at the same time, these law firms are starting to get pressure from their clients to say, hey, why am I still paying for this stuff when AI could do it? Or what are you doing to be more efficient? And so there's kind of this pressure to switch to alternative fee models. So doing more on a flat fee basis. And you see some of the pioneering firms starting to take steps in this direction. Um, we're working with one firm in particular that is looking at ways that they can identify certain repeatable functions and switch them to a fixed fee basis. Um, so kind of taking little bits and slices out of the work that they're doing and try to move it to fixed fee and then to automate it and make it a lot faster. Uh, because as soon as you take something out of the billable hour and onto fixed fee, then the incentives completely flip and your incentive is to make it as fast as possible. So yeah, it's a very interesting evolution and I would say we're still pretty pretty much in the early stages of it, but that's hopefully helpful for the folks in the audience who are not like legal tech nerds like I am. It's fascinating. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, a few things I, I do find fascinating. The first is you're describing technology replacing some low entry level functions. And so everyone else in the sector having to adapt and go to higher level functions, this is actually the history of humanity and technology. I mean, before we used to be farmers and cut the grass ourselves in the fields, and now we have machines doing that for us so we can go up to the next thing, which is, you know, working into services or the industry or something like that. And, and inside that sector, it's exactly the same thing that's going to happen. And it's what's called creative destruction, I believe, where some low-level jobs are, you know, destructed and, and don't exist anymore, but this allows you, allows everyone to move up to some higher skills and, and to a higher level. Obviously, it's not that simple. You know, if you're 60 and you're three years from retirement and your job gets replaced, probably you don't have time to, you know, get up to date on a new job and those last three years are going to be problematic. So it's not all smooth and 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 and, and pink and shiny, but Overall, it is beneficial to humanity. So that's the first thing that's fascinating to me listening to you. The second thing is you're actually participating exactly into that with point one. So you mentioned it probably too briefly, but point one is at least starting with automating with programming and with AI that timekeeping thing that's just bugging almost every lawyer that they have to do all the time. And you just kind of automating that away, they don't have to do anything. It, it, it tracks it, everything automatically, correct? Yeah, so exactly. That's what our application does today. And this is kind of where we landed from those customer discovery interviews. And that was very simple, right? People hate timekeeping. 
there's problems that arise from it. Let's just automate this. We think this can be done with LLMs in a way that it wasn't done before. That's all turned out to be true. It works, people are using it, and that's great. But what we've actually settled onto is maybe a deeper insight, which kind of stems from the discussion we were just having, which is we can actually use the data from the timekeeper to enable this transition to fixed fees or to alternative fee arrangements that we were just discussing. And so one of the core problems right now is that the leaders at law firms don't actually understand what people are doing on a given project or matter. So like, let's take an acquisition as an example, right? You might have 20 different lawyers working on that acquisition for six months. And then at the end, you know, it closes, everyone gets their money and great. If I'm looking at that as sort of a law firm leader and I say, okay, I want to try to automate some parts of this acquisition process. Let me try to figure out like, where's the best place for me to apply AI? I actually have really no idea what, how much time is being spent on the different components of that deal, right? So there's the drafting of the merger agreement, there's due diligence, there's all the negotiations, there's all these different subcomponents to every case or deal or matter that a law firm would work on, but they have no idea right now how much of their time is even being spent on those different pieces of the workflows. And with the current tracking systems that are, people are using to, to do hourly billing, they're not sufficiently granular to understand how much is being spent on each thing. And so then it's really hard to know, okay, like where do we invest in AI if you don't even have that information to begin with? And so what we realized is like we can actually use the data that's being generated from the time tracker to help them understand at a much more granular level like what's actually going on under the hood. And then we can also use that to uh, price alternative fee work. So if they're going to be doing things more on a fixed fee, we can help them to actually figure out how much time that's going to take and therefore how much they should price it at, which is one of the current barriers. I mean, a big reason for the persistence of the billable hour model is that Pricing legal services is notoriously difficult, very unpredictable, and depends on a lot of factors. And, you know, there just hasn't been sufficient technology to properly predict this stuff historically. So these are some of the other areas where we think the, the time and billing stuff can be helpful and, and relevant in this sort of broader uh, shift. And I do think that the billable hour will persist probably forever in some capacity because Certain kinds of legal work are just not amenable to a fixed fee model, right? If I'm doing something that's highly unpredictable, that involves me interfacing with a third party, and I have no idea what that third party is going to do, there's really no way for me to effectively price that. There's too many unknowns. And so what I expect is going to happen is that we'll shift from, you know, for an 85% billable hour today, maybe that'll shift to like 20 or 40% billable hour, and then there will be some flat fees and maybe some other kinds of alternative fee arrangements. And so we're going to end up with this mixed bag of a little bit of everything over time. And so basically our product direction and strategy is like, let's help lawyers with whatever stage they're in within that mix, right? If they're on the billable hour, great, we've got a thing for that. If they're on alternative fees, great, we can help them make that transition to alternative fees and do that more effectively. You win in every case. Whatever happens, wherever they are at the stage of their firm, whatever they want to do, keep the billables, don't transition, whatever they do, you're going you're gonna to be selling something for them. That's pretty cool. Tell me about you know, how you got started. So you find the co-founders, you interview the lawyers, you land on this. Then what happens, I believe quite literally, I, I, I think very soon after that, you went to YC, like tell, kind of tell me the, the, the story of how it went down. Yeah, so I started working with my co-founders <clears throat> in a more serious way. You know, we'd been kind of doing some customer interviews lightly, but we kind of decided, okay, let's actually get together in the same place. They were in New York at the time, I was in San Francisco. And so I flew out to New York and we spent a couple of weeks working together in person and the YC application was coming up. And so we said, okay, let's just submit an application and we'll see what happens. We weren't really expecting anything. And also the, the deadline to get back on the application was like a few months away. So we just dropped the application in and we were like, okay, great. We've got a few months to figure it out. We'll try to make some progress before we get the, the interview. We ended up hearing back five days later from YC and it was on a Friday night and they were like, your interview is scheduled for Monday morning. We'll see you then. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so we just got on that interview, got in 
you know, the next day. And then at that point it was like, okay, well, I guess we're doing this. And so then that was kind of like the starting gun for us. I was surprised, but actually turns out that YC accepts about half the startups now with just an idea. So I think we're not atypical in that regard. But yeah, then at that point, we basically started to write code. We knew what the end goal was, uh, which was, you know, fully automatic timekeeping. It's actually a fairly hard product to build. I think pre LLMs, it was not really possible to do it to a high degree of accuracy, or at least not with an amount of capital that, you know, startups could reasonably allocate. Maybe Google could have done it, but, you know, you saw some folks try to do this and I would say largely fail to achieve an acceptable level of quality. But we thought we could take a different approach and basically just go straight to, you know, modern LLMs like GPT-4 and just kind of put a lot of the burden of figuring the stuff out back onto the models. And that turned out to, to be true ultimately. So. Yeah, we spent a couple of months coding. Uh, We launched the product in January. When we first launched, it was a really bare bones MVP um, that wasn't even fully automatic. It was kind of semi-automatic. And then we added some more automation over time. And so now we're at a point where the lawyers can basically just uh, flip the toggle on when they start working, let it sit in the background their entire workday, and then turn it off whenever they're done. And then they get their full list of, uh, you know, their full time sheet uh, generated. So that's the dream. Yeah. And we're still trying to, you know, improve the quality of that. Again, it's a kind of like the driverless car. It's like pretty easy to get to 80%, pretty hard to get to 99%. And so we're still kind of trying to transition and, and gradually improve the quality. And then, yeah, we're, we're now starting to work on some of the other elements of the billing and invoicing process and some of this sort of intelligence and uh, prediction functionality as well that we just talked about. And you raised a massively oversubscribed round, if I'm not mistaken. We did. We had a, we had a pretty good fundraise. Um, Congrats. Thank you. Appreciate it. The, the biggest thing for us was we want enough capital to sort of allow us to build for a while and we want to get it done quickly and, and get back to work. I think there's a lot of sort of glory assigned to fundraising and people want to talk about it and brag about it. And, and that that's all great. But really, we viewed it as kind of a side quest, like we need to get this done so that we can be capitalized, so that we can you know stay alive for a while and, and have breathing room to build this thing out. But we want to try not to get too focused on it and try not to take it as sort of a measure of our success, but rather just an enabler. And so our approach was to just try to move as quickly as possible, close things out, not stress too much about having, you know, the world's best investors, but really just get it done. But yeah, I mean, very happy to talk about sort of fundraising tips and tactics. If that's uh, I relevant. mean, first of all, I, I believe you're absolutely right. Fundraising has become such a goal in itself, where actually, you're right, it's just an enabler. It's just the very beginning of the journey. I mean, once you fundraise, now you got to deliver and give your investors a return on their money, et cetera. So, and people just are, you know, so excited to boast about their fundraising on social media and and it's almost the end of the journey for them. And, and so, yeah, you're right. It should actually be the beginning. I mean, I would love to talk, as you just mentioned, a little bit about fundraising for people who are listening to us. There's a lot of people trying to raise money, funds, startups, of course, and it's not easy. It's not easy in the current environment. It's for sure it was easier for you because of YC than most people who are not at YC. So the first advice could be try and make it into YC. But I mean, instead, if you have some some tips and tricks, I, I would love to hear them. But I would actually love to ask you, what did you put in place to, like you said, to try to move things along as quickly as possible? How did you keep some sort of sanity not to get too crazy, like, oh my God, we're raising millions and millions and this is amazing. And I, like you said, you, you didn't let it get, get to your head. So what was your your thinking, your strategy? How did you make it happen so quickly and, and keeping your head cool all, all the way through? Yeah, there's a few layers here, right? I mean, the first one is to just, uh, our YC uh, partner, Dalton, had a good line recently where he said that running a startup is like a series of mini games. And at each mini game, you have to figure out what the rules are, and then you have to execute within the context of those rules, and then you move on to the next mini game. 
The mini game that I'm currently in is called sales and lead generation, but uh, fundraising is certainly its own mini game. So I think the first thing is to understand that this is not the real game. It's a side quest and should be treated as such. Um, and so that's to the point of not letting it get to your head. Fundraising does not determine your worth as a company. It does not determine your success or failure, both on the upside and the downside, right? If you fail to fundraise also does not mean that you are a failure. The two things are largely uncorrelated, but I think that's the right framing to approach it as. And then, yeah, fundraising is kind of a game. There are rules. It can be won or lost, and you need to learn what those rules are and then execute within the context of those rules. So there are certain very tactical things you can do that help a lot with this. One thing is really sticking all your meetings in a very short period of time. I know the investors don't like it when I say stuff like this, but from a founder leverage perspective, it's incredibly helpful. YC does a very good job of this by sort of sticking everyone in a short period leading up to demo day and around demo day. But you could execute this same strategy independently as well. So basically you stick all the meetings in a very short period of time. I think in a week I took about 60 or 70 meetings with investors. So it was rough. Huge. I mean, it was yeah. the most the most tiring and adrenaline-filled week that I've ever had. But uh, what it allows you to do is once you get some early traction and you know once your round starts to fill up, then it allows you to go around to all the other investors and just force them to make a decision fast. You don't want to be disrespectful. You don't want to say, tell me by 5 p.m. today. But you know, after within the first three or four days, we were able to go around to all of our investors and say, look, we have more interest than we think we can handle here. We're going to shut this down by Monday. So please, if you'd like to invest, let me know by Monday. And that allowed us to, you know, it, it forces their hand. We're not trying to force them to invest. We're just trying to force them to make a decision because in the investor's mind, it's in their best interest to wait as long as possible. And ba basically, the longer they wait, the more information they get about whether you're good or not. And so their interest is I'm just going to delay, 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 see what else happens you know, see if you can make some progress, see if you get other good investors. And then your incentive is to try to get them to all move as quickly as possible. Yeah, you're right. Because the longer they delay, the longer you're distracted. And really, you're not going to be able to do anything else while you're fundraising. It's wholly consuming from, a, you know, every, everything else is, is going to stop, you know, your sales motion, your product development, et cetera. So tactically speaking, that, you know, I think that's the way to go. And then there's some really important things around actually telling the story. I think probably the most important thing that I did, and, and this was kind of an unlock, it's not, not where I actually started, but I, I got some feedback from some mentors of mine that pushed me in this direction, was to actually start my pitch with a little bit of storytelling. So talking about what's happening in the legal tech space, why things are changing, where things are heading, and actually why I think most people are doing it the wrong way. So we started out with some kind of contrarian views, a little bit of what we talked about earlier, that I think most people are chasing after shiny objects here and that most people are not actually following the customers and what the customers want. And so I think starting out the pitch that way enabled a couple of things. It enabled me to show that I know what I'm talking about. I come from this world. I know this world better than you do, and here's why you should subscribe to my view of it. And then the second one was the contrarian take really gets people's attention. And I think getting attention is, is almost like half the game in fundraising. Investors have to sit through a lot of pitches. If you can show them something that says, hey, I actually know what I'm talking about, and you should pay attention to this, that really helps to, to start things out. And then beyond that, just kind of storytelling. Like I think being able to effectively tell the story of your company and why your company will win and become large, that story may or may not become reality, but the more effectively you can tell it and the more effectively you can believe in it, the more people will also believe you and the more effective you'll be. So yeah, that's a, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a fundraising expert by any means, but I think so. Those are some of the sort of tactics that were helpful. I mean, getting the round after done. what I just heard, I would say you're a fundraising expert. Honestly, <laughs> this is pretty cool. This is pretty insane. We're almost running out of time. I wanted to ask you, probably people are, I'm, I'm wondering this as well. Pro, people watching this are thinking, okay, all of this is 
by the way, this is super actionable. So thank you for everyone that's going to use this. But with YC, you have that advantage that a lot of investors are going to come to you. And so to line up all those meetings in a week is probably fairly easy. I'm guessing. I'm not sure. Maybe tell me if I'm wrong. But if you're not going through YC and you want to line up all those meetings in a week, how would you go about that? And you probably haven't had to do that, but how would you go about that? Well, I think the first thing you can do is pick a date in the future where you're going to start fundraising. So when you get in, you know, when you get meetings with investors, don't just take the meeting, schedule it for a certain date. So pick whatever your date is a month from today and say, this okay, is cool. when we're starting fundraising. Could you book a call with me that week? I just set up a calendar link that started on a certain day and then you know, give that to investors. You can actually be even a little bit more tactical and place some of the more relaxed or lower value investors at the start of the process so that you have a couple of days of practice. I don't think I, you know, my first like 10 pitches, I didn't get <laughs> any bites because I think they were pretty bad. So it, it takes some time to kind of get into the, the groove of things. But yeah, picking a date that's in the future, schedule everything for that date. I think a lot of other folks have probably talked about how to you know, get meetings with investors. You have to treat it like a sales process. You have to have a CRM. You have to focus on pipeline, building top of funnel. Um, it's very much like sales. YC kind of shortcuts some of this stuff for you by making it so you don't have to go out and find those people. They kind of come to you. And so that's one of the major advantages of being in YC. But even if you're not, you can still execute it in the same way. You're just going to have to go out and chase the investors rather than, you know, yeah. having them come to it you. It is a sales process in the end. And people don't realize that. And when you do, it unlocks everything. Adrian, you've been awesome talking to today and very generous of your time. I want to wrap this up. I usually end up asking for a book recommendations. You already gave us one. I ask, what did YC bring you? you, you you've answered that. So I think we're pretty good on those kind of regular closing questions. I just have to ask you if people want to follow you, follow along the, the, the adventure of point one, where can they find you? What, where, where can you send them online? Uh, LinkedIn is the best place for us so far. You can follow me on LinkedIn. You can follow point one and uh, check out our website. And if you know any lawyers, please introduce us because we would love to chat with them. That's awesome. Adrian, thank you again for being on the show, giving us a glimpse behind the scenes and into the future of the legal tech. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe for more conversations like this. And don't forget to rate us and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time on The Lobster Talks, stay bold, stay curious, and remember, those big ideas start somewhere. <laughs>